So I wanted to begin by just talking about a word called character. If you're asking your kids, your grandchildren about character, they'd probably say it's an avatar or an emoji. But to me, character has three very important meanings. The first is, does that person have great character? I don't need DocuSign, I don't need a battery of lawyers. This is a person that says what they mean and means what they say. It's a person that says, I love you to his wife, and you know that that love is true. The second thing is, is he a character? I've always been fascinated by characters. People that I don't have to swim with the tide, I don't have to chase false stereotypes. I can be who I am, and I'm happy within who I am. And if that character happens to be magnetic, with this engaging smile, with this wonderful personality, it just takes it to a new level. And the third thing is characterize. With someone that has an ability to synthesize information, to make sense of what the world's going on, the complexity, and compress it. Sometimes as a poet, sometimes as an author, in our case, as a political cartoonist. So I'm so honored tonight to bring to the stage Andy Donato, who has great character, who is clearly a character, <laughs> and one of the great people in this country at characterizing moments in time. Please give it up for Andy Donato. This is Chatter That Matters with Tony Chapman, presented by RBC. I do this for a living, but I've never actually been interviewing somebody in the Taylor Swift category. Now, the, the second you were announced as the speaker series, you weren't only just sold out, I had people on the golf course, and you've seen me golf, I'm not a great golfer, in the middle of a swing, coming at me saying, can you get me into Andy's event? Wow. What makes you so popular? I have no idea. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, I'm just an ordinary guy that, that likes to draw and paint, that's as far as I'm concerned. But yeah, I mean, you're not a just- A lousy golfer. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're not just Taylor Swift, you're almost in that Madonna and Drake. As soon as we say Andy at the Hunt Club, everybody goes, I love Andy. So Andy, I want to take us back to Andy as the kid. You, 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 grew, you grew up where? Scarborough. Well, I was born in St. Mike's, uh, lived in Toronto for a year and then moved to Scarborough. My dad was an Italian immigrant and opened a grocery store. And uh, that's where I grew up. Catholic, so not necessarily birth controls in your repertoire, your family. How many siblings? Oh, just one sister. Wow. God love her. That's a busy grocery store. A year and a half older, <laughs> older than me. And um, she's going to be moving into a, an old age home pretty soon. <laughs> and I'm glad I'm not. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so when we were talking earlier and you said that one of the things that you fell in love with at an early age was comic strips. You never really quite finished it. You kept redoing it, but yeah. take us back to that time and where did that pen and paper all well, began? Well, what, uh, I, it was just because I was interested in art and drawing. Love comic strips. I draw, I invented some horrible character and I would draw these strips and the Scarborough Mirror had, was a paper that was in Scarborough. And uh, one of the salesmen came in one day and I tried to sell him my strip. <laughs> he just looked at me and said, yeah, well, keep, you know, get several done and me, but look at it. The problem I had was that I would, as, as I drew the strips, I'd get to the third one and it was so much better than the first one that I'd scrap it and start over again. And I never completed more than three strips. <laughs> so was, they couldn't sell to anybody. You know, Italian immigrant coming to this Canada to create a new life, grocery store. How did your dad view the fact that his only son was, oh, was art? Well, he, being an Italian immigrant, he wanted me to be a lawyer or a doctor. And uh, which I would have made a lousy lawyer and I'd kill more people than a doctor. <laughs> but, um, he, everything I drew, he, I'd show it to him and he'd look at it and go, <laughs> like that. And it, you know, it was very discouraging. My mother, on the other hand, praised me to heaven, said, oh, what a wonderful job and all that. 
And um, anyway, it, but it, it all came down to when I um, I was 18, I graduated from uh, from Danforth Tech. Well, I want to re re rewind the tape before you get to Danforth yeah. Tech. I love the story of you being in high school oh, yeah. and convincing the principal to let you go to Danforth Tech oh, at I, night yes. underage. Yes. Like I, a lot of people at your age want to do other things underage, but you actually wanted to go to night school. Yeah, I had done a little oil painting. There, there were two cupboard doors in this in Kennedy Road Public School, and I mixed powdered uh, tempera paint with olive oil, and I painted these two scenes. And um, I, I got talking to him, and he said, well, you know, well, I'll see if I can give you a letter, and if you can go to Danford Tech, the night school course, take up painting, we'll try it. And they accepted me. I think I was 12 or 13. And uh, I, you know, walked into that class and everybody kind of looked at me, what's this little punk doing here? <laughs> they were all older people. And that, that's how I started. I started doing, um, now I got to admit, every once in a while I'd go by the Allenby show where there'd be a good movie on. And I'd skip night school and go to the movie. <laughs> It's about time First we. First time I've ever said that. You know, it's about time we give this confession because a good Catholic should. It's been 50, 60 years longer than you should have. Good a Catholic. Okay, so now you end up going to Danforth Tech, yeah. And but in grade ten, you realize that your incredible art skill also comes with quite lacking spelling skills. You do a yes. poster for the zoo. <laughs> well, actually, before before I just started at Danforth Tech, and I'd seen this poster for visit the Toronto Zoo and a beautiful uh, picture of a giraffe that somebody had painted. And I thought, wow, that's what they do here. I got to do one of those. So I, I went home, got the illustration board and everything, and I did a, a poster up for visit the zoo. Took it into the teacher and said, is this any good? And he looked at it and said, yes, very good. But visit has two eyes in it. <laughs> and ever since then, I've been a terrible speller. Yeah. Just think what you would have accomplished in your career if Grammarly had happened in, oh, your, right. in your early days. Yeah. And, and Danforth Tech, you graduate, but you're still a little bitter at the place that you graduated. When I was in uh, fourth year, I had three things I had to, I wanted to accomplish. One was design the yearbook cover, which I did. The other one was be the first one in the class to get a job outside, which I did. And I missed standing first by half of 1%. What the hell happened? You're such a failure. It was a spelling. <laughs> And so let's 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 move now on to your career because you were the first to get a job. Yeah. And I love the story about because one of the great things about your personality is that you almost remind me sometimes of Columbo. If you remember the TV show Columbo, <laughs> he wanders in and you kind of think he's just innocent. And next thing you know, he's solving the greatest crime. And <laughs> it seemed like throughout your life, you look like you're bumbling into these amazing jobs. Let's start with the first one at Eaton's and how did that came about? Easter Monday, I packed up my big sample case and uh, went downtown, went into Eaton's, talked to the art director. He he opened my, he was looking at my samples and he said, you spelt that wrong. <laughs> Another spell. Then he said, I can't use you. Go over to branch stores. And I went over to branch stores and they said, okay, you, you know, we like your work. Uh, 22 bucks a week is what we pay. Here. And uh, he said, but since you've been to school, well, we can start you at 35. Well, I thought I'd die in one hand. My father was paying me $2 a week <laughs> in the grocery store. Yeah. So I, uh, I, 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 then I couldn't. Did you go to him like the ECDU? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> no, the deal was when I got the job, uh, first thing he did was he went out to West Hill where two of my teachers lived and got them together and said, he's got a job at Eaton's. I want to send him to the art college. And they said, take the job at Eaton's. <laughs> You'll learn more. I said, okay. So that was settled. They said, okay, now you it's $15 a week board if you're living at home. Or you can work in the store when you come home from Eaton's two hours a night. And that saved me 15 bucks a week. I did that. A year later, I, I, he came to me and he said, do you like what you're doing? And I said, I love what I'm doing. He said, good, I'll sell the store. Because he wanted me to take over the grocery store, which I hated. 
How did you feel walking into that? I mean, an artist to me is always seeing this expansive world. And we talked about your characterization of taking the expansive world and compressing it. It must have been a prison going in that grocery store for you. No, the, the problem with the grocery store is I, I didn't mind serving people. You know, that was fun. I, there were there was jobs that I had that I hated. It was getting potatoes out of a sack, putting them in a bushel, and then putting them into 10-pound bags. I hated that job. <laughs> I don't understand why. It was sorting, <laughs> sorting pop bottles, you know? There was Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, Wilson Ginger Ale, Sun-Kissed, Hires, 7-Up, all these. I had to sort these bottles out all the time. Hated doing that, too. You're listening to Chatter That Matters with Tony Chapman, presented by RBC. But you got to remember that you never let the truth stand in the way of a good cartoon. The, the only rule we have in, in cartooning is fair comment, because you've got a good argument. And that's, that's the only rule I go by. My guest today is a political Rembrandt. He's a cartoonist, and he's a legendary Canadian. His name's Andy Donato, and this is our conversation recorded live from the Toronto Hunt Club. So you're working at Eaton's and you make the next move on your career board. Mm -hmm. What happens? I, I wasn't happy doing the, the work that I did there because we were doing those circulars, you know, slot flyers, everything, and ads. And uh, but I was looking around, found an ad in the paper, found a part-time job at a little art studio downtown. So at five o'clock, I'd finish working at Eaton's and I'd zip down to the art studio and work there for three or four hours a night. And when did the girdle in the fridge happen? Was well, that at Eaton's? Uh, yeah. <laughs> One of the ads I designed had a refrigerator and a woman's girdle. Yeah. I, I, I laid the ad out, we sent it out, and when the paper came out, I think it was the North Bay Nugget, if I'm not mistaken. The paper came and uh, I, I wanted to see my ad that was in the paper I designed and they had switched the copy. So the girdle had a pull out meat drawer. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand why you stayed in art and stayed away from words. I, I really do. So this part-time studio actually turns into leaving the security of Eaton's to... Yeah, he, uh, he eventually hired me. I left Eaton's for at $66 a week to get $68 a week. You're quite a negotiator, Andy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and I loved working there. And uh, it was a, his name was Bob Kale. He was a little chubby Jewish guy who had great sense of humor. A nice, great guy to work for. And, I, and I, I still resent to this day. I delivered a job for him one day to Arcade Press. And Judy Shapiro, another chubby little Jewish guy, said, what are you doing working for that guy for? You could be on your own and making more money and would pay your car expenses and all that. I thought, that's great. So I, I said, OK, we'll set up a company and we'll do it. I went back and I gave Bob my letter and said, here's my two weeks notice. And he said, well, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to go to Arcade Press. He looked at me, and I'll never forget, he said, that's my account, you son of a bitch. Get out right now. And I was devastated. I mean, I couldn't. You know, Andy, I know how devastated, because when we talked at breakfast a few weeks ago, there were still tears in your eyes. I mean, that was a, well, it, that was a massive lesson in life, it wasn't really it? It hurt, yeah. It, it was a great lesson. And, and I, the worst of it was I never had a chance to, to apologize for it. And he, he was such a great guy. Anyway. So tell me about Shapiro, because what suddenly you oh, go from he, yeah. you go from being uh, setting up your own studio yeah. to kind of being in the soprano world. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I, I, I wound up meeting a bunch of uh, uh, our, the, the main work I was doing was for something called a broker dealers association. A bunch of, of uh, guys that selling stocks like consolidated moose pasture, underwater <laughs> airways, <laughs> rectum <laughs> gas. Okay. And I would design their their uh, their lead getters, they called them, their direct mail. And they, they'd go out, then they'd get people responding for their market letter. I'd design the market letter. And then they would sell them on this mining company they were setting up, they're digging for gold. And I would do these fancy brochures up. So the work was lovely. I did it great. Uh, they, they paid well. Uh, if I delivered a job ahead of time, they'd give you a $20 tip in cash, which was nice. Stay in your pocket. And, um, and that's where I ran into a guy named Albert Volpe and the Volpe family. 
very family oriented people. <laughs> and uh, thankfully, he likes you because we're still talking. Family in Buffalo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of the days you're chatting with them, and he says. Have you got your money out of Shapiro? Oh, yes. He said, because uh, he did it, Albert's printing for him. And Albert, I, I actually was at the Capri restaurant on Young Street. And I, Albert wanted to buy a painting off me, which I showed him. And it was a, a picture of a miner with an axe. And, and it was still wet in oil paint. <laughs> and I remember Albert touching it. And he got red on his, he's good God, the axe hit me. I'm bleeding. <laughs> anyway, he said, how much money does Julie Shapiro owe you? And I said, I don't know. 300, 400, he's collected. And I said, why? He said, never mind, just collect it. This was on a Sunday night. Thursday came along, the 28th of March, 1961. Uh, Judy came out of his thing and said, uh, see me on Monday, we'll close up your business. I said, what? He said, They've, the United States Security Commission said cease and desist all direct mail from brokers coming in to I me, mean, I say, these guys all got shut down in one day. So I lost 99% of my business in one day. And, and, and the next day, my son was born. Yeah. <laughs> so, and wait a minute, I went home and got to open the mailbox up, and I had a letter from OHIP saying, because you were late sending in your payment, we can't cover any medical set for three months. No. So I had to pay for his birth in the hospital. Oh, and the doctor. What do you? What did you learn about that? Because I mean, as a as a pay your bills. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Andy, for that. That's that's incredible information for my audience. Uh, but you know, as a, as somebody that's a free spirit and just wants to create and design, and what did it tell you about that time in your life in terms of you know just chasing money, understanding the sense that especially with a, now a wife and a kid. Maybe an artist needed a bit of bedrock. I suddenly realized that, you know, this freelancing is, boy, you've got to have a lot of clients to make any money to even exist. I desperately started looking for a job. Then, thank God, I, there was a job open in the Telegram. The old Telegram. Maybe, but you telegram? spent a bit of time finding that job. I mean, there was a little bit of stress. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, I, that, I, was, I was stressed out. Making calls to anybody I thought would need artwork, and wound up getting literally no business at all. Uh, I had two accounts. One was Volkswagen Canada, uh, but they hardly ever did anything. And the other one was a printing outfit around the corner, which eventually gave me a little office to work out of, right across from the Telly building. Job came open to the Telegram. Applied for it. And I didn't get it because I was asking for too much money. Edens called me and said, come on back. And I just couldn't do it. Uh, I said, I'd rather starve to death than go back there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, what happened then was that one of the, um, I phoned up and they said, I'm sorry, you didn't get the job. We hired two younger guys, uh, one guy named Greg Constantine and a guy named Ken Dan. <laughs> <laughs> and, and everybody knows Ken Danby, who became one of Canada's great realist artists. So about, a, about two months went by, and he called me again. He said, one of our girls is pregnant. She's leaving. Do you still want the job? Before he could say it, I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so the, the, the worst of that was uh, I went to see him. He, he, we settled on the money, which a lot less. I, I didn't care. I said, how much that doesn't matter? Because I was down on my last mortgage payment. Mm -hmm. The advertising director was on holidays, so he couldn't get approval for hiring me. Three weeks went by. The art director was on holidays. So six weeks went by before he called me and said, when can you start? And before he finished his sentence, I said, Monday. <laughs> so you go into the telegram and you're in a pool with artists. Once again, this sort of independent spirit comes out. You hear rumors that they're thinking of doing a makeover on the newspaper. Oh, right. Well, I started the telly. They were moving into a new building on Front Street two years down the road. That was 63, we moved in. And I thought, you know, if this paper looks like hell. I thought it was, I thought all newspapers look like hell. Because I was into typography and design. So I started redesigning the paper on my spare time at home. And one of the uh, workers at the, in the advertising department heard about it. I gave her what I had done. She gave it to the executive editor. He called me in and said, is this your stuff? And I said, yeah. He said, leave it with me. He called up 
James Douglas McFarlane, who's this big marble head by blue eyed guy who would scare the hell out of you just walking around the building. He was an infamous editor. He called me up and said, we're going to lock you up in an office on the third floor at 29 Melinda. Nobody goes in that office but you. I'll send you down what I want. You draw it. And they send it up to me. When the paper moved on Thanksgiving Day in 63, uh, the new telly came out on Monday and it was all my design. Wow. And I got moved from promotion into editorial, and that's where I started in the editorial department. You're listening to Chatter That Matters, my guest, Andy Donato. And in a moment, Andy and I discuss how one man's daily chore becomes another man's lifelong success story. It's Tony Chapman from Chatter That Matters. I asked Canadians about their money matters. We talked debt, inflation, interest rates, and many were worried, and some felt they could lose everything. In response, RBC has created My Money Matters. It's a site where you gain financial knowledge, you learn how to manage debt, reduce stress. There's even tools and apps to help you deal with the realities of today. Visit rbc.com slash money matters. Your financial well-being matters to you and to RBC. You're listening to Chatter That Matters with Tony Chapman, presented by RBC. Today, I'm speaking with a former editorial art director of the Toronto Sun, an iconic editorial and political cartoonist, Andy Donato, recorded in front of a live audience at the spectacular Toronto Haunt Club. So I love the story of you in the editorial department because you're sitting in this room uh, and the way you characterize him is a lot of misfits. <laughs> and, yeah. and well, that's when I started. Yeah, when that was I. I uh, Al Beaton was the cartoonist. Every day he walked by my my desk and put his cartoon in the dumb waiter that went down to the engraving department. And he, most times he would complain about the job. And I said, "Geez, you know, you draw one damn cartoon a day, <laughs> and you're complaining. I'm doing six, seven pages, laying them out, and everything." He said, I just had to put up with those assholes. <laughs> so anyway, and I, I went home that night and said, I got to draw a cartoon. I got to be that tough. So I drew a cartoon on the flag debate in Ottawa. The flag debate was going on in Ottawa. So I had Lester Pearson, Real Cohen, John Deepen Baker, and Tommy Douglas all holding up a flag. The flag was called a compromise. It had dollar signs, it had maple leaves, it had kitchen sink, it had everything on it. And the editor, I took it in to show Al to see if it was any good. The editor saw it and said, oh, geez, that's great. He's Al sick. I can run it. So he puts it in the paper. It runs in the paper. Time magazine picks it up. They run it in the Canadian edition. I thought, this is great. They even paid me 50 bucks for it. <laughs> Trouble is, you know, Al still had the job as the cartoonist. Yeah, but just hold on. Not just Time magazine. It's in the encyclopedia. Americana. Americana, your cartoon yeah. is part of our history. Yeah. I mean, so don't think. Yeah, let's give it up. I mean, no, it's Canadian. Okay. Uh, and, and so you, you, you now re- realize that maybe instead of drawing mastheads from the newspaper or yeah. refrigerators yeah. and girdles, cartoons would be a pretty good well, gig. Well, yeah, they, they saw what I could do. So the, one day the, the uh, executive editor came to me and said, Al Beaton is going on holidays next week for three weeks. You're drawing, you're filling in. And he said, he said, just come into the editorial meeting, make sure you're wearing a jacket and tie <laughs> and uh, with the editors and bring in three or four ideas. I thought, oh my God, it's bad enough getting one idea for a cartoon, three or four. <laughs> so I'd come in at nine o'clock in the morning, I'd be feverishly working, trying to come up with, and, and I, I got to tell you, I knew nothing about I couldn't tell you who the prime minister was. <laughs> anyway, I started drawing these rough sketches, and I'd go and sit down at the meeting, and, and Bassett would come in. And he was, you know, Bassett was like six foot six, and he had a voice that could blow you out of the room. And he was just frightening, and I have to stand there and hand him these little cartoons. Anyway, I survived all that. There but was, hold on, Bassett, he never picked the cartoon that you thought he should right. pick. I would, I, would, I would do three or four sketches, and I'd put an X on the one they're going to pick, and I'd put a zero on the one. <laughs> that was the best cartoon. 
he always picked one with the X. Yeah. What happened was, <laughs> the, the big story that day was Canada's foreign ownership policy. <laughs> and I kept trying to think, how do I, how do I draw that? How do I illustrate that? And it, it, honestly, God, it was eight hours later, I thought, I'll just draw a blank square there. <laughs> <laughs> so I took it in. I was in the editor of and looked at it. And said, what the hell is that? And I said, I explained it. He said, yeah, great, we'll run it. Yeah. <laughs> and we ran it. <laughs> we got a lot of comments on it. <laughs> and Joe Clark's mittens. Oh, yeah. yeah, when he lost his luggage in uh, <laughs> Africa, I think. Or, anyway, I, I had to do a cartoon on that. And right at the last minute, I, I drew the, the idiot mitts on him. You know, and that was it. It, it stuck to him like glue. Yeah, the mitts like a kid. Yeah, a, yeah a kid. Cause you, uh, there's, and by the way, he um, spoke to a bunch of cartoonists in Edmonton a few years later. And, uh, and, and he, somebody said, who do you want sitting next to you? And he said, Donato and Peterson. <laughs> Peterson was our cartoonist in Vancouver. And we sat down and he got up to make a speech and he said, I just got to tell you, uh, he says, what it's like getting up every morning and opening up the newspaper and seeing those goddamn mittens. <laughs> <laughs> so but he was a great guy. Andy quite possibly put up the first sequel in a cartoon because a little while later, Pierre Elliott Trudeau's plane is hit by a truck on the tarmac. It's kind of funny how the Trudeau's in the planes, but anyways, that's, <laughs> a, that's another. And, and, and the cartoon that you did was... Oh, I did the, the plane with the damaged wing <laughs> and the bus that hit it. And the, the, the security guy is saying, we well, don't know who was driving the bus, but we found these and he's holding up the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You've gone on and won so many awards, uh, including Cartoon of the World, and so just uh, incredible accolades. Is there one cartoon that stands out for you that said, you know, you're going to live all of us, but if there was ever a tombstone and a cartoon of you on it, what would it be? The flag at Iwo Jima. That, I think he may have it, mm. uh, where they're raising the flag, and I won. Uh, I submitted that to a national newspaper award. And it didn't win, but the one best editorial cartoon in the world. Yeah. That was my all-time favorite, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's it right there. Yeah. That's when the remember the Americans were taken hostage in Iran, and that was the Ayatollah Khomeini. And that, it was called the American Dream, which I think is underneath it. Yeah. I wanna just shift a little bit because I talked about your character and there's not a person in this, the Toronto Hub Club that doesn't hold you in the highest regard. And you should be very proud of that because that's right. something that's earned over many handshakes and many beers and stuff. But I want to talk, you're wearing the shirt of a very talented artist. It's the love of your life. And I want to hear a little bit about, oh, there she's over there, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't mean to appoint. I, he was he was of good character, but he's obviously got a girlfriend. So, uh, I, Diane, I want to. I mean, first of all, she's an incredibly talented artist. But tell us how you two fell she, in she love. She did this shirt for me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've ordered one, so stand in stand in line. But I mean, this is your your second marriage, and when I had yeah. dinner with the two of you. My wife, Marion, and I came away and said, they still flirt like they're teenagers. <laughs> and I want to know how you met and what is the secret to enduring love? Diane came into the sun. I was hiring artists. She applied for the job and I hired her. And she was, was she first, talented or just beautiful? No, she was, she was, she was, she, I didn't think much of her in those days. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, I think she lived in the beach. Uh, she wasn't very good. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, she was on a three-month trial. Okay. And the three months went by, and my assistant art director, Jeff Crawford, and I talked about it, and he said, she's not going to make it. She's not really that guy. I said, okay, give her the last week, and I'll tell her she's gone. Well, that one last week, she did a complete flip-flop. She turned out some really wonderful work and everything, and I, I was I thought, geez, I can't fire her now. So we hired her full time, and, uh, and and that was it basically. And then I tried to take her to the secretary's lunch because she did a, answered my phone for me and I wasn't there, and they wouldn't let me. So I promised her I took her out to lunch. Oh, 
And then I took her to another lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then we uh, fell in love. And, yeah. Then we're still in love. So, how many years has that been? Forty-five. Forty-five years. And I, I've been. Sprint bell. I, I <laughs> for one of them, anyways. I, I, I've been told not to talk about a certain weekend in New York, and I won't. I won't. But I just want to tell you that. I blushed for 14 hours after hearing that story. <laughs> you are a Randy Andy, <laughs> aren't you? I used to be. <laughs> so fine art and painting, that came across because you got a severance and you decided that you could start putting your work to paper and not having to deal with editorial people throwing X's and O's at you. Yeah, that's right. I, um, I mean, there was a time when I, I didn't get the job at the Telegram after Al Beaton died as a cartoonist, uh, they didn't like the editor in chief didn't like my work. Everybody else liked it but him. And I was I, I went to uh, high school one day. I was going to talk about uh, look at teaching art at Cedar Brain. And uh, I was standing in the hallway waiting to talk to the principal. And the bell rings and all the doors open and all these young ladies are coming out in mini skirts and I said, this isn't for you. <laughs> don't, don't, you don't want to teach anything. So I didn't, um, I went back, I started. Uh, Is I that the only time you've ever listened to your angel? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I started doing uh, cartoons for the Windsor star. Yeah. And, um, that went on for about a year or so. But the painting, I mean, that came. Yeah. Well, I, I was painting at night at home and I, then I had an art show at the car gallery in the colonnade on Brewer Street, and it sold out. So I thought, gee, that's good. Then I had another, next year I had another art show, it sold out. And I thought, this is great. And then the telly closed, I thought, well, I've made money off my art shows. I got a bit of getting money from a severance. I could go a whole year without worrying about money. I can just paint for a living. And of course, then... I get called into Creighton and they're going to start a newspaper and yeah. that was it. And what happened there was that um, they had, the money was all set up. Uh, I went, uh, the, the Thanksgiving weekend was coming up and that was the deadline for the guys to come up with the money to start the paper. They didn't come up with it. So Thanksgiving weekend, 1971, I said, that's it. I'm going up north to paint. I'm going to be a full-time artist. I came in Monday morning, Creighton's waving at me like crazy, my publisher, and he said, we got the money, start designing the paper. Peter Worthington, the editor, phoned Eddie Goodman, top lawyer in Toronto, great conservative, and he raised a half a million dollars over that weekend, and that's how we started. Any regrets because that's a tough, when you've made a decision over a weekend, I am going to become a full-time artist. I am my own boss, like your dad was in the grocery store. And you show up on Monday and going, get back to work. I was so excited about the paper, yeah. starting the paper, that um, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't mind. If, if, if it had gone the other way, I would have done it. I, I wouldn't be where I am today, painting for a living. Uh, I don't think, anyway, because it's a tough market to sell paintings. That the, the newspaper just excited me. Well, first of all, because I was still going to be drawing two cartoons a week, and that's what got me excited about doing that. You're listening to Chatter That Matters with Tony Chapman, presented by RBC. It's really funny. The bird, I was, I was drawing a, a cartoon one day, it had a tree in it, and I just drew the bird up in the tree, and I never thought anything of it. But I thought that kind of cute. Because um, there are a lot of cartoonists that Yardy Jones had a cat. I, I just kept drawing the bird every day in the cartoon on a necktie or in a, for about a month, I guess. And then one day I forgot to put it in. The switchboard lit up. Everybody wanted to know where the bird was. My guest today is a political Rembrandt. He's a cartoonist and he's a legendary Canadian. His name's Andy Donato. And this is our conversation recorded live from the Toronto Hunt Club. Andy, as we sort of wrap this up, it, I want to know, is it DNA or is there a secret for you to be forever young? Because I'm talking to somebody <laughs> in their 80s who has got so much passion. Your eyes are shining. 
someone of immense character, a character that also characterizes. What's, what's, is there any secrets yeah. that you can share with us? Oily Italian skin, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I need a little more than that. That is partly responsible for me. She uh, takes good care of me. I own a drugstore at home. I mean, I have, I have all these pills I have to take and everything. And, uh, and, I, and I think I just enjoy life. And I, I have no debt, which is great. So you can really enjoy life. And I travel, I can't travel as much as I used to because they are not covered by insurance anymore. But no, she's, she's the one that keeps me going. And your art. I know that Diane continuously reinvents herself. When I talked, she just talked about starting to paint fabric. And next thing you know, you're in this incredible shirt. How about yourself? Like, do you, as you start looking back at your life, does that change what you put on canvas? No, I don't think so. I, um, I just enjoy living and I enjoy playing golf. And uh, that, that, that's basically it. I've had tons of friends. I mean, most of them are here tonight. Yeah. <laughs> um, and again, I, just, uh, I eat well mm. and I drink well. I've stopped drinking actually <laughs> because we're going away and we're going to be on a ship on a cruise, river cruise, and I want to eat. So I quit drinking. <laughs> And I've just 17 pounds already. So. so you got 17 pounds of alcohol. Yeah, That's yeah. right. <laughs> Once again, the rung on the ladder. And, and the last question, because you've got some beautiful paintings that are up for sale out there. And oh, yeah. does it matter who buys your paintings and where they put it? Or once you've painted it and you sell it, it it's, it's gone? No, I'll tell you, the only thing that bothers me is anybody who buys a painting because it matches the drapes. <laughs> I, I paint, uh, everything I paint is just strictly feeling. Mm. You know, like the, the hunt club ones, I walked this up the ninth in winter time, and it's all just a feeling that you get when you look at something and you rush home and try to put it on, on, on a panel, paint it. Um, that's basically it. And during the winter when I can't play golf, I spend all my time painting. Yeah. Always trying to come up with something new. I got, I'm working on a new project right now. But the thing I miss the most is when I had my house, I had a little workshop in my garage. I could go out there and make build putters for putting. As you see, me have a long putter. Couldn't buy them way back then. I started making them. Over the years, I made over 100 putters. Wow. They're all thrown out now because they never worked that way. <laughs> Uh, no, that's it. That's been it. Yeah. You know, Andy, I always end my show with my three takeaways. And uh, the first one is you just radiate humanity. I mean, I, I loved getting to know you when we had breakfast, when we had a chance to have dinner together. And tonight that you just are something we should all aspire to. You love life and you love everything about life and you don't get caught up in the negativity and all the things that are wrong, you focus on what's right. And I think that's an important lesson yeah. for, for so many people. The second thing is your love affair. And, oh, yeah. and, and <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, you know it's, it's so, you guys talk, you look at each other in the eyes, you hold hands, you support each other, you believe in each other and, I think in this world where we're so preoccupied with screens and who's connecting with us and who's validated and who likes, the fact that you just have this connection is to me so much more important than connections we can get in this virtual world. And the third thing is that you're a gift to Canada. Like I think what you've done, the prime ministers that have talking about you, uh, uh, you, you you, you've captured so many moments in our history, but with your sense of humor and insight and characterization, and I think we're all better for it. So I just want to oh, say thank you. thank you for being part of Chatter That Matters, and I think this gentleman deserves one of the great Toronto Hunt Club applauses. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great interview. Joining me today is Dina Patel. She's the Senior Director for Merchant Experience and Loyalty at RBC. Dina, my guest today is Andy Donato, and he's in his 80s. He's still an editorial cartoonist for the Toronto Sun, a fine art painter. He is a force of human nature, 
and one of the early trailblazers in the gig and creative economies. And that's where I really want to focus your attention is that he was a trailblazer, but today the gig economy, side hustles, having more than one job, not necessarily having a guaranteed paycheck, all factoring into my home enterprise or business. Is that the type of client you're interested in at RBC or you look, or you're more interested in someone that just has a secure paycheck? No, Tony, you're absolutely right. And what an amazing uh, creator that Andy is in his storytelling and, and the way that he captures the attention of the crowds. Now, more than ever, we're seeing that people are leaning forward into what they could be doing from a gig economy, from a side hustle and creating businesses of their own. Now, actually, RBC just launched an SMB, a small business a poll um, with results that that were really featuring in Canada this uptick in people wanting to spend more time doing entrepreneurial things and having side hustles. Uh, so it's very much contemporary and RBC is here to help. And we absolutely are partnering with businesses and uh, new businesses coming into play across Canada. The last time you were on the show, you pointed my audience towards owner, O-W-N-R, which is a great place to sort of register your business, validate it, and work on a plan. What else are you doing? Is there a site or a hub? Is there content that I can just go and kick the tires and kind of go, I have this idea and I just want to learn a little bit more about what does it take to make dreams a reality? Oh, Tony, there's lots of resources readily available. And I would encourage people when they're thinking about turning their dream into a reality, maybe they might want to check out the RBC Small Business Navigator. It's online and it uh, it provides people with offers, resources and advice right at their fingertips, depending on what they're looking for and where they are in their journey. Um, and I also want to comment, we've just, uh, we've also got education. If there are people that want to learn a little bit more and understand more, we're doing, um, we have a program called the Founder's Journey. And it's in partnership with Western University, where we offer free online education, readily accessible. If you're interested in spending a little bit more time and learning a little bit more so that you can jump into something and make it real. Dina, I hope they bottle your energy across the bank because you just have so much passion and enthusiasm for what you do. And I thank you for being on Chatter That Matters. And I want you to know that I will be knocking on your door many times because I love sharing stories of small business heroes and you're certainly someone that loves to support them. So thank you for joining me in Chatter That Matters. Thank you, Tony. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to the next opportunity to chat again. Chatter That Matters has been a presentation of RBC. It's Tony Chapman. Let's chat soon.